All right, guys, hope you're having a great day today. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can actually build an outbound machine that's going to generate you 30 to upwards of 100 appointments even uh, every single month to get qualified pipeline so you can scale your B2B startup uh, or your already existing B2B venture. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and jump into this. But before we do, my name is Keelan. I'm the founder of a company called NeonAcquisitions.com. You can check that out in the link in the description. Uh, I'll also leave this doc in the description if you want to look at it yourself, look at the concepts, uh, read it in more detail. Um, this might be a lengthy video, uh, as my previous one was. Um, but uh, that's because I'm trying to give you as much value as much detail um, and as much articulation as I, I possibly can. So um, uh, anyhow, so you'll notice I'm wearing the same hat from the last video. I think I was wearing a tan hat from the last video. That's because today's my hair is wet. And <laughs> so you'll have to, I won't be wearing a hat for every video I put out, don't worry. But uh, let's go ahead and preface this. I'm a prime example of the top level of bias when it comes to cold outreach, okay? So uh, I do believe that paid advertising is a great method, especially when it comes to scaling your B2B venture. Um, but I think that B2B uh, paid advertising should only be used at scale, not when you're a startup. Do not give up your funding uh, or any kind of growth uh, budget allocation towards paid advertising until you have product market fit and you're at a point where you can deliver upon your claims uh, and whatnot. Uh, so usually I would recommend uh, transitioning to paid advertising uh, once you're really establishing a lot of cash flow and you have budget to kind of just burn right because paid paid advertising when you first start is going to be a lot of burning on budget okay so um anyway i've run hundreds of campaigns at this point for b2b SaaS, e-commerce agency consulting firms accelerator programs uh etc so here's just a few campaigns from 2023 um you'll see 21 hundred thousand dollars worth of opportunities generated out of 700 emails um that's about a um what is that? That's about a, I don't know the percentage of booking that is, but, um, and then we have uh, eight opportunities, $36,000 generated out of 240 emails. Um, I didn't calculate the cost of these opportunities, but um, 10 opportunities generated from 241 emails, right? This is just a few campaigns I've run uh, this year. Um, some of the more successful ones. And I have other screenshots, uh, but just want to show you a little bit that I do know how to build <laughs> outbound uh, acquisition campaigns. So uh, with cold outreach, you can spend less than $500 per month on software, operating costs, lead scraping, email domains, LinkedIn accounts, uh, and you can sign upwards of $50,000 uh, $50, worth of clients, uh, assuming your LTV is $10,000. Uh, you can and you book 30 appointments per month and close at 20%. You can get a high ROI, 100x ROI from cold outreach. And you can get even more than that, right? Uh, when you're looking at the enterprise long-term value of a client, right? Um, even on upfront cash collected, you can make um, even probably a 25, 10 to 15x ROI um, on your investment. It just kind of depends on your situation. Um, but when you're a B2B venture, especially a startup capital efficiency and speed matter the most when it comes to acquisitions you don't have time or resources to waste on paid advertising and you don't have kpis locked in you don't have i'm assuming you don't have product market fit at this point um and you don't really have the time to allocate towards learning how to use meta's dashboard trying to generate decent creatives which by the way is a whole hurdle in and of itself um so again cold outreach is going to be your most effective method and most capital efficient method of acquiring clients when you're first starting out or even later on like uh, i have a friend of mine who has a b2b SaaS. they're doing probably seven figures at this point and they use cold outreach to do um enterprise uh, to reach out to enterprise uh, uh companies uh because they have enterprise plans so um I warn you, do not run, I, I said this already, but do not run paid ads without product market fit or a scalable plan. Do not touch paid ads unless you have product market fit, you have a scalable system, and you've, you've got things locked in. So the, for, the, for the first six to 12 months, depending on your venture, um, you want to uh, ex, uh, focus exclusively on capital efficiency um, and running the most cost-efficient method of uh, acquisition, which is again, cold outreach. Is cold outreach hard? <laughs> Very, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Is it a skill that will always generate cash flow and translate into multiple businesses? Absolutely. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Is it high ROI? Absolutely. Okay. This document will speak directly to and exclusively to the topic of cold outreach, paid ads, SEO, or 
other uh, other methods of traffic won't be discussed. Okay, so all in all, I believe that paid advertising, SEO, and other methods of marketing and traffic are in fact great methods and very relevant at a certain point in the business's lifetime. However, when it comes to achieving product market fit, or when you're starting out, you don't you're not doing seven figures or even six figures yet. Um, outreach is the most triumphant method. Okay, so. First concept that I kind of coined recently, the trinity of outbound success. So um, I don't think it's necessary to have this. Uh, there we go. So so this is kind of a graph I pinned. Um, this is really what outbound success boils down to. Evidence, the claim, and targeting. You cannot have one without the other. Uh, before I get into like the nitty gritties, how to set up a campaign, how to schedule appointments, how to copyright, all that stuff, I want to talk about the fundamental principle. This is the trinity of success when it comes to outreach, okay? You can think of it as the concept of the God of Christianity. I'm a Christian, so this is a very relevant uh, way to compare it. God is made up of three distinct persons, not three gods. Uh, without one or the other, the Godhead does not exist. Without the Son, there is no Father. Without the Father, there is no Spirit, etc., right? So you must glue these three concepts together as if they are one kind of bubble, right? So uh, they cannot exist without each other, right? So the claim, let's go over this one. Um, so what is a claim? Okay, so it's pretty self-explanatory, but in regards to your your value proposition, your, your current venture, you're basically trying to make a bold statement that you can accomplish exactly what your market wants, how they want it done, and when they want it done. So I'm not going to give speci specific practical examples. Um, you can look at my value proposition on LinkedIn or even in this video um, or on our website. Our value proposition is that we uh, are trying to help B2B ventures scale to a million dollars in annual recurring revenue without third-party agencies or SDRs or paid ads and help them prepare for a long-term exit. That's really our value proposition is we're trying to be a growth, a growth partner rather than a third-party agency so we can help you grow over a long-term trajectory. Okay. So again, no practical examples because I don't want to create unconscious copying or cognitive bias, but if you want an example, you can look at mine. Okay, so your claim needs to be a compelling promise that provides a solution to your market's current problem or painful situation. I'm going to talk about a concept called fundamental copy um, in just a second, uh, but first let's go over creating hypothesis and paper validation. Okay, so this is kind of the first step when it comes to creating claims. Okay, so I'm assuming if you're a startup, you already have some sort of claim. You might have, you might even have it validated, but let's talk about how these are usually evaluated. So claims cannot be based on assumptions, but rather than educated hypothesis. Don't ever assume your market's desires based on your current understanding. Go to the market itself and ask the simple overarching question, what do you want? Okay, so this is called market research, as you probably know. Um, and you've probably done this before, but I'm going to kind of show you my process of market research and perhaps you can implement it to create variations of your current claim. Okay. So create a basic rational hypothesis. You do this by going to the market, asking for feedback and you iterate on your hypothesis. Okay. So you should always be iterating on your claim, um, until you've kind of locked, locked it in and you know, your market wants what you have. Right. Um, the best, the best way to validate. Uh, whether or not you have what your market desires is if they're buying it, right? That's really product market fit. You have a claim and the market's buying it, right? You're able to market it well, and you know that people, you're generating interest, you're generating sales. If you're able to repeat that process, you have found product market fit. That's basically product market fit in nutshells. Um, you can add nuance to it, but that's basically the process. So market feedback and validation. First, you're going to create a hypothesis, okay? Take it to the market. If the market affirms it, then you can repeat the cycle with at least three to five experts. Okay, so uh, if they don't affirm it, you're going to reiterate. You're going to keep reiterating until you're getting affirmation. You're getting validation. Okay, so this is the basic foundation for solving a product market fit, like I just said. Um, so I'm going to go over kind of experimental validation and um, MVM assets. Okay, so MVM asset stands for a minimal viable marketing and assets, uh, and I'm going to briefly touch on evidence. Okay, so. Um, once your claim is validated and proven, uh, and you can prove that your market is in need of your hypothetical claim, you can put it to the test through outreach. Okay, so outreach is truly going to be the test whether or not the market wants to buy into your claim. 
Okay. Your market may validate your claim through conversations, Zoom calls, forums, texting conversations, but the real validation begins when you start to experiment on your hypothesis. Okay. So once you've built your claim, once you have your hypothesis, once you have it validated on paper, then you can take it to the market, get into the trenches and start sending emails and ask and trying to get feedback, right? That's where the real kind of work begins. That's the dirty work. Okay. So, um, before you uh, take your paper validated claim into the market for experimenting, you need to build your uh, MVM assets to support your claim. Uh, I'm going to refer to this as MVM assets throughout this whole video. Um, if you don't know what that is, once again, it's minimal viable marketing assets. Okay, so basically, you know, your sales letter, your your website, your your landing page, your VSL, your case study, stuff like that. Okay, those are your marketing assets. Anything that anything that a prospect is going to look at and create interest out of, right? So this is where we start building evidence and foundational copy. We'll talk about this in point two and discuss the details of experimental uh, validation later on in this document. So returning to the hypothesis, your hypothesis when it's first conceived cannot be a random spin up. Okay. This might work if you're a wizard, but you can't just spin random stuff up. Okay. You have to make some educated assumptions. Okay. So it first needs to be done through a well thought out first phase of research. Let me define the categories of research for a claim. So these are kind of the three categories of research that I've coined. Um, I'm not saying I made it up. Uh, I mean, maybe someone else has, maybe I have made it up. I don't know. So the first step is going to be web-based research. So this method of research consists of leveraging the internet, YouTube videos, existing forums, stuff like that. Chat GPT is a great option these days, but you have to, you have to come up with very good questions. Okay. You can't use surface level. What does my market want? You can't say stuff like that. You have to make extensive prompts, really dive deep into what chat GPT is giving you. Um, so don't, you have to use chat GPT effectively. I'll make another video on that, but, um, that's a great way to do it. So my preferred method of web-based research is just go on clutch.co, uh, review, um, start scraping the reviews from my competitors. So for example, let's say I was running my lead generation agency again. If I wanted to figure out what my market wants, I would just go on clutch. I'll actually go ahead and show you an example. Let's see if I can pull it up fast enough. But basically I can go on clutch. Let's go to mobile app development. Let's say I'm an app development company. Uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, any location, let's go to naked development and you can go to, um, the reviews down here and you can look at like what the feedback they're giving people, right? They're talking about, usually talking about what's, what they most valued out of their partnership with this, uh, with this agency or whatever. You can look at this stuff. You can like, this stuff is actually like juice, <laughs> um, for lack of a better word. Um, so leverage this well. Um, something that it's a little bit more advanced. You can actually have someone on Fiverr build you a Python scraper and just scrape all the reviews of your competitors and then just go into chat GBT and kind of use the same language to ask questions, right? I'm not going to make a, I'm not going to go into that, uh, in detail. Um, but it, it's a great, it's a great, very powerful method. Okay. So anyway, with that being said, uh, LinkedIn discussions, I like going on LinkedIn and kind of talking to people. Uh, going on forums or uh, LinkedIn groups, just kind of seeing what people are up to. Uh, podcasts, a great way to do research because they're having intellectual discussions for hours on end. Um, but this is obviously the easiest and lowest barrier to entry uh, method to do research. However, you will miss out on nuances and extremely useful insights that market feedback based research is going to give you. So that's the second method. And this is probably the most superior method. Um, when it comes to forming a great hypothesis. So the reason why this works so well is because you're going straight to the market and you're asking them for feedback. Okay. So how do you actually execute that? You're going to cold email people asking to do research. So you can say like, I'm writing a paper. I'm a, I'm a college student. I'm writing a research paper. Um, that's an angle you can play with. Um, you can message people on LinkedIn, do the same angle, uh, ask family and friends in your industry. If you have family and friends in your industry, um, Go to local events or offices in your industry that's untapped. Uh, nobody is going to, people nowadays are not going to walk up to somebody in person and ask for feedback, uh, but it's a great way to get feedback. Okay. So this is going to be the most difficult method of research because oftentimes uh, you will be asked to pay for experts time. So 
if you have capital, obviously this is not a problem, especially if you're funded, but um, typically you'll pay three to $500 per 30 minute session with an expert. So let's say you are uh, a FinTech company, your startup, and you want to talk to uh, banking companies as an example, and you want to figure out, you want to get their feedback on your product, your hypothesis. Um, make sure you prepare something intellectual, have a slide ready to go. You're not trying to sell anybody anything. So you're not trying to go through a pitch. You're just trying to get feedback. That's all you're trying to do. Um, and what you'll actually find out is people might actually want to, <laughs> if you're doing it very well, if your hypothesis is good, um, you might actually convince the person you're interviewing to buy your thing, uh, which is sometimes it happened to me on accident. But um, I, just to kind of give you an example, for me personally, I interviewed a software development company um, about neonacquisition.com, and they actually wanted to work with me when I was trying to teach them about my hypothesis. So uh, sometimes that happens, but um, but yeah, they're usually more likely to get on a call with you if because you're not trying to sell them anything, you're just simply asking for research and insights, okay? So focus on this method if you can, really go hard on it, use as much capital um, as possible that you're willing to allocate to interviewing people. I would I would interview at least three to five people minimum. If you can get to like 10 or more, obviously it's better, but three to five um, top tier experts is good enough. Okay. So, and when I say uh, experts, I, I typically mean like executives at your ideal customer. So again, if you're targeting a banking, uh, a banking company, um, you might want to uh, talk to the CMO, uh, email the CMO, say, Hey, I'm doing a research. Do you mind if I interview you? Stuff like that. So um, sometimes people have already done that work for you and you can just go on YouTube and find these podcasts or these zoom discussions. So, um, but anyway, experimental based research. So this is the method that should always be executed. Um, you can skip, you know, you can skip number two. Um, you can't really skip number one cause you can't just create something out of thin air. Um, but if let's say you've done point one, um, you can go on to point three if you really can't do number two, which you should always do number two. But number three is really, like I said, where the dirty work is done. You've theoretically proven the existence of an object. Uh, now you just have to experiment to prove it exists physically versus theory, right? So um, how do you execute? You're going to send 500 unique cold emails. And based on the feedback that you get, you're going to reiterate upon your claim, right? So by the way, um, this could be a copywriting issue if you're not getting the results you're looking for. But anyway, after iteration, send 500 more. Continue until you have a KPI of booking two to five qualified sales meetings for every 500 meetings, right? So we're going to talk about this later, but those are kind of your KPIs um, that you should have locked in. So move on to sales process. Um, so given the information above, you're going to you're going to perform this type of flow. So phase one, you're going to do you're going to make a hypothesis based on web based research, okay? An educated hypothesis. Uh, take it to the mar uh, the market for feedback. Um, have some takes take that feedback into consideration. I would recommend documenting it um, and then get a paper validated claim. Okay. So you have a theoretical claim that has been validated theoretically, right? It hasn't been validated through experimentation yet. So on phase two, that's when you do that. You're going to do outbound experimental research. Um, and if you're not hitting KPIs, you're going to reiterate until you start hitting KPIs. Okay. Because you've already got it validated on paper. So there's not really a reason why it, it wouldn't work um, with your experiment, if that makes sense. So um, and then once you're hitting your KPIs, your hypothesis is validated. Okay. So, um, so again, I already shared my personal story with this, but you're going to magnify log uh, logistical implications. So this is more related to, um, the specifics of your claim. So you'll hear a lot more about, um, you hear a bit about logistical implications in the evidence portion, but the idea of magnifying logistical implications is you want to magnify uh, the concept. So a, a huge factor and the reason why people buy services or products is they are purchasing an implication that you have versus your competitor, right? So if you take two fintech companies, just as an example, um, the fintech company that addresses the implications, the logistics of their claim in a little bit more detail, um, they are typically going to see more success. So I'm going to give you a practical example but the more logistical implications you can allocate towards yourself, the more differentiation you're going to have in your claim. So that might not make a lot of sense, but I'm going to show you an example. But don't fall into a dangerous trap of making the same claims as everybody else. Use your creative thinking skills to find logistical implications 
to expand and implement into your value proposition. So um, you're going to have an overarching claim, but don't stick to one angle. Create different variations of your core claim to test and play with. Don't They don't need to be drastically different. You don't have to create like entirely different packages, but just try to re, re, represent it in like a different, you know, a, a different color, so to speak. Uh, the same concept, but just a different color, right? Or a different shade, you know, rephrase them, address different or unique implications to create different, uh, to, to create different, uh, differentiation. So make, making claims, uh, when making claims, make them crystal clear with crystal clear outcomes. They must be quantified. They need to be very specific. You can't say things like, um, we help fintech companies get more customers through advertising. You can't, you know, let's just say you're a marketing agency. Uh, that's a very broad claim. It's not very clear. Um, you have an overarching, we help fintech companies through advertising, but you need to be specific. We help fintech companies in this unique situation achieve this specific outcome through this specific mechanism. Okay. So we're talking about implications already. So, um, Let's see. So here's like my basic formula when creating claims. So specific problem, unique mechanism, address implications, um, pricing, the terms, risk reversal, and guarantee. So if I had to put this into a sentence, we help fintech company startups that are struggling to um, uh, have capital efficient methodologies of customer acquisition, get customers through organic methodologies, so unique mechanism, without hiring SDRs, that's an implication, on a performance-only basis, so that's the terms. Um, and that's also a guarantee, so on a performance-only basis or, you know, you don't pay, so that's like our guarantee or risk, uh, risk reversal. You can alter this, um, but that's just kind of an example I'm spinning up. So the evidence. Take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence, there's no better rule. Charles Dickens, great, uh, great expectation. So the claim you make is only as good as its evidence. If you're making big, bold, otherworldly claims, you need evidence to support that claim. You can't just make bold claims and not have anything to justify it. Okay. Um, skepticism is a natural human reaction that will destroy your business if not handled properly. So how do you combat skepticism? Um, through You do that through evidence, obviously, right? So practically speaking in the realm of B2B business, it's through sales assets. It's through marketing else, uh, marketing assets. So minimally viable created material that demonstrates the competence of the person making the claim. Uh, the most superior example of um, evidence is going to be a case study. So a case study demonstrates the person making the claim is competent at the thing they're claiming. Uh, they can deliver upon their claims. Uh, evidence that the claim can be performed. Someone testifying to the truth of that claim. So not only are you like proving the truth of the claim, but you have someone else proving the truth of the claim. So if you're interviewing someone and that person is testifying to the truth of the claim that you're making, that's more evidence, if that makes sense. So you have two people, um, maybe you know the person that's in the case study, you have someone supporting the truth of the claim. You have a, and eventually you have a crowd of people supporting the claim if you have more case studies, right? So uh, with that being said, uh, a case study can make the difference between a prospect dying for your service or product or a person who tells you to screw off. If you don't have evidence to support your claim, you get you get a lot of screw offs or you know f offs, right? So people want to see evidence that you are capable of producing a bold claim. You cannot just send people emails promising the world and not have assets to back you up, right? That's utterly pointless. Okay, uh, otherwise you're going to be labeled as an internet scammer. So. Um, one of the first things you want to set up is sales letter. So sales letter, prov uh, this document right here is an example of a sales letter. You're providing a, a logical understanding of exactly who you help, what problems you're solving for them, and the intricate details of deliverables, the ultimate outcomes, stuff like that. If you don't have access to case studies or testimonials, you need to write extensively on sales letters. Um, this is I've probably written 100 pages in the past week or so, um, and you're doing this to demonstrate competence. You need to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about, that you've done research, that you know their language, that you know their struggles, right? So other ways to demonstrate competence are going to be through a video sales letter. You should always have a video sales letter. You need a landing page. You need social media presence with educational content, especially on LinkedIn. Uh, YouTube is a channel I love to leverage. Um, it's very high, uh, high authority, so to speak. 
writing letter, letters and documents like these. These are sales letters. Uh, in regards to what I've mentioned about uh, MVM assets, uh, these are pieces of evidence. So marketing assets are your fundamental assets that need to be in place before you begin outreach. You can't, you do not start outreach until you've built out your, your marketing uh, assets. Okay. Um, build your brand on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is pretty much essential. You can't, people always look for my LinkedIn. Um, I'll send a cold email to someone and they will manually go on their phone and they will just go look for me, right? They'll go on their phone and then they'll be like, you know, let's find this Keelan guy. And then they'll be like, oh, you know, Keelan's posting this, he's posting that. Like this guy seems pretty legit, right? So people are going to do that with you pretty often, okay? Fundamental copy. So this is kind of like the, the pregame of building sales uh, or marketing assets. So I recommend spending a week or so on building out your copy. Uh, what is fundamental copy? Anything that pertains to your hypothesis, ideal customer, their pain points, their demographic, anything at all, word vomit all of it onto a spreadsheet. Okay, so ask yourself questions. This is very intimate with yourself, by the way. This isn't something that can be delegated. Um, so who's your ideal customer? Job titles, location, pain points, current situation, desired outcome. Answer all kinds of questions like these. Just word vomit all into a spreadsheet and kind of create an SOP. Um, so you need to write this out, spend some time on this. This is also going to play a significant part into your claim uh, and your offer creation. So when developing these assets, you need to have a crystal clear clarity on exactly what problem you're solving, for whom you're solving it, and why. You should be able to communicate your vision and your offer to someone with enough conviction for them to join your team. This is the DNA of your company, your foundation. Okay, so the fundamental copy is going to be the very DNA of your company and your venture. So list out as many ideas about your audience as possible, getting crystal clear on the founder or as a founder and who you're searching for. Um, this will uh, make your hiring process a lot easier in the future. This is hardly a process that can be delegated, nor can it be skipped or done with sloppiness. Take your time on the stage. If you have to, if you need to go outside and just write on a notebook, go ahead and do that. Like just make it as intellectually and um, compelling as possible. So uh, addressing the implications of claims and evidence. So I go over this in my, um, our primary sales letter, which is uh, zero to a million annual recurring revenue for a startup. Making a bold claim raises concerns or questions, address the implications and repeat. So this is a little bit of secret sauce. I don't see a lot of guys talking about this, but let's let's just jump down here to the example. So um, let's see. So you're going to make a claim. I thought I had an example here, but um, you're basically going to create your claim. Your, your claim is going to raise a concern or a question logically in the person reading it. So for example, let's say we do Facebook ads for fintech companies. So that's a start. So why do you do Facebook ads? That's an implication. That's a concern. That's a question. You address that by saying we run Facebook ads because um, it's more scalable than cold outreach, right? Um, that's an implication addressment. Um and we do this without so for us for example one of our implications is um we don't uh we don't leverage agencies we don't you don't need to hire an agency with our process right so that's an implication right so i'm having a little bit of a brain fart on this so but think about this process uh this is very much an intellectual process so this can also create unique mechanisms so differentiate differentiation can also be created by simply renaming your mechanism. Um, there's an example by Alex Ramosi right here. Um, he found that his book created, he had more differentiation with his book just by renaming the title. So renaming your claim can literally make all the difference in the world. I've personally experienced this firsthand. Um, I remember one time I was promising clients in our cold emails and I changed the word client to referral and my, res my results literally, literally doubled. There's not much of a difference between a client and a referral in the, you know, long-term trajectory, but it literally doubled my cold email campaign results. Okay. So repackaging your, your claim can make the, you, you don't have to change anything about your mechanism. You don't have to change the deliverables. You don't have to change anything on the back end. You're just changing the name. That's literally it. So perceived authority and trust. Um, so as you, 
as you build more and more assets, you're going to create more authority and trust. And that also increases the value of your product. So as you get more and more case studies and more and more testimonials and more and more evidence, you, you create a high value perception of your offer. Okay. So, and you can start raising prices. You can start uh, taking on higher quality team and stuff like that. So let's move on to targeting. So you could have the most irresistible claim, the superior extensive evidence and still not get results simply because you're not targeting the right people. So this is very fundamental. It's very crucial. Uh, we refer to targeting um, in more specific terms like ICP. So that means ideal customer profile. I'm not going to read too much of this out loud, but really I can summarize this whole thing by saying really focus on who you're targeting and make sure it's not so narrow that you're targeting, that you can, you know, target everybody in one week, right? So I recommend having a TAM, which means total addressable market over 5,000 worldwide. 5,000 worldwide is pretty small even, but that's a good start. Um, and you might even want to create different claims for different ideal customers. Okay. So you might have, you might be the same company, the same off, you might have the same backend, the same, uh, mechanism, right. But your, your marketing angle is just different enough. You're tweaking it like a knob enough to where you can target a different market, right? So create different iterations of your ICP along with a different claim. Okay. You should have one overarching claim that kind of speaks to all of these demographics, but you want to create kind of like sub claims that you can speak to different ideal customer profiles. If what I'm saying makes sense. So, um, I can't, so the unfortunate thing is targeting is really something you can't, that can't delegate, that can't be delegated. I don't know your situation. Um, I can't really teach you how to do targeting, but this is really intimate to yourself. Um, here's an example. Here's a few examples of ICPs just to kind of give you a feel. Uh, VP director head um, of sales marketing or growth, uh, specifically for fitness e-commerce brands doing less than $10 million per year in North America. That's an ICP. Okay. CEO founders of fintech startup companies in Europe with C to series A funding. That would be one of my personal um, ICPs. CMO of roofing companies in the US hiring for lead generation specialists. Right. So that could also be an ICP. So play around with these different filters, these different um, ideas. You can kind of use these as an example and kind of make it your own. So uh, channels. So consider where your prospects hang out, whether that's literally at an in-person event or on the internet. Um, if your people are impossible to find on the internet, uh, you might want to create a new ICP uh, because your ICP is probably, it, you want to have an ICP that's accessible. Okay. If you can't access them, you can't sell to them. Okay. And if you can't access them easily, like on command, then <laughs> your ICP needs to be iterated. Okay. You want to be able to easily and very seamlessly access your audience. Okay. You should be able to go on LinkedIn or on the internet and, or even Facebook and find people that you're looking for. Okay. It shouldn't be a very difficult process to find your ICP. Um, there are some offers where that works. Um, so for example, I knew a guy that sold enterprise software to fortune 500 companies. Very, very hard to do, but uh, one of the ways they did that to capture their attention is by giving them free AirPods. Um, so, you know, um, that's kind of a different subject, but hopefully you get the idea. So let's talk about the intricate details. So let's talk about direct response methodology. We've kind of go, gone over the Trinity, the fundamental. Uh, direct response methodology is what you're going to utilize to get people. This is the type of marketing that's utilized to get people on the phone. Direct response marketing is a type of marketing strategy where the goal is to encourage an immediate response from consumers in order to quickly generate leads. So that's from adjust.com. That's not from me. Uh, di direct response marketing is probably the most widely used form of marketing on the planet. In fact, I'm actually not aware of anyone <laughs> that uses any other form of marketing if it exists. So direct response applies to all forms of outreach, cold email, cold calling, LinkedIn, Facebook, content marketing, etc. So direct response, it's pretty self-explanatory. You are sending out a claim into the market and you're trying to get a direct response. You're trying to get a response from the market, right? And that might not be the same day. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. Either way, you're getting a direct, you know, it doesn't, have to, it doesn't necessarily have to be a yes or no, 
um, but you're trying to get a direct response. Okay, so you can kind of read these here. I spun these up through ChatGPT to kind of iterate on what I'm saying, but you want to create engaging messaging and compelling offers, something that demands an urgent, uh, you want to create urgency, you want to create emotional connection, you want to create a sense of value, um, you want to create something that's compelling, um, you want to create immediate engagement um, or quick engagement. Like I said, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. It doesn't have to be today. It can be next week. It can be next month, right? Um, data tracking and optimization. This is very important. It's very key when it comes to uh, direct response marketing is that you're tracking a lot of numbers. It's all about the numbers, okay? If I input 500 emails, I can predict an output of three to five meetings minimum in the ideal scenario. If I input 100 LinkedIn messages, I can predict an output of five meetings, once again, in an ideal scenario. When I say ideal scenario, I'm really referring to the idea that you had your KPIs locked in for outreach. It takes a few months to lock your KPIs uh, where you can mathematically and predictably calculate how many outputs you receive based on your inputs. Uh, but when you're starting out, you can't make predictions yet because you haven't done enough testing or experimenting or iterating to say, if I do X amount of outreach, I'll get Y amount of results, especially if you're a startup, it's, you can't, you're not at that point yet. Um, but as, as time goes by, you're able to predict if I do a hundred LinkedIn messages, I'll get this result. Right. So, um, but these are the AB uh, KPIs you typically want to aim for. If you're not seeing these results, uh, typically means you want to do some iteration. So 1% minimum booking rate for all unique contacts. So for each 1,000 people you contact, you want to get at least uh, 10 meetings or 10 interested replies. Okay, this number is typically higher on social media platforms. Usually you can get closer to a 3% booking rate if you contact 1,000 people on like LinkedIn. 70% uh, show up rate. So make sure that 70% of the meetings that you book show up. And yes, not everyone will show up. It's a 100% show up rate doesn't exist. Okay. 30% um, acceptance rate. Um, I don't know why I just went down like that. Uh, let's go back up. Uh, yeah, 30% acceptance rate for every 100 LinkedIn connections you send, you want about 30% to accept. Um, that depends on who you're targeting and your industry, but that's a ballpark, right? So for some clients, it's been 45%. For some clients, it's going to be 20%. 60% uh, lead to call rate or LCR. For every 10 interested replies, you get six people that book a call. So newsflash, not everybody who says they're interested will fall through. Um, that the, the, Typically, those people you want to keep following up with until they give you a yes or no, right? You'll eventually find what math and KPIs work for your specific industry and product through testing and research. Your numbers are extremely important. You need to track everything, okay? One of the biggest mistakes I see founders and sales teams make is they won't track their numbers, <laughs> okay? You have to track everything. The numbers are what matter in this game. It's really a numbers game. You know, cold calling, that's especially a numbers game, okay? I will discuss the tactics of systems and cold emails and other channels, but I want to cover the fundamentals and uh, that you can apply across multiple platforms, teaching you not only how to fish, but also how to set up your fishing rod. So direct response marketing is a topic with shelves of books. It's extremely extensive. You can check out some of these resources here if you want to learn a little bit more about direct response marketing. Um, but let's go to cold email. So cold email has been and probably always will be my preferred method of generating leads on my calendar. Uh, just yesterday, I had four interested replies on a brand new cold email campaign I launched. Um, uh, but why is this my preferred method? Because everyone has an email. Everybody. It's just a matter of finding them. Okay. Cold email is also extremely cost efficient. Let me break down the cost for you. So disclaimer, this math um, and KPI assumes you have product market fit already. In order to see these types of results, you need to have a great claim that's already been validated. Fantastic evidence and proper targeting. Okay, so 20 domains is going to cost you about $140 per year, um, $140 up front, I believe. Um, two accounts per domain. So you want to create, um, you can get away with one, but if you're trying to go for higher volume, you want to do two accounts. Three accounts is pushing it. You can do three accounts per domain, but I recommend two. You want to do two accounts per domain, you want, and that's going to cost you about $240 a month. An AI sending tool is going to cost you about $97 per month. That's what it costs me right now. Um, so each account sends 30 to 40 emails per day. So you're sending a, you're, you're sending 1,200 to 1,600 emails per day. Okay, that's hot. That's pretty high volume, and that's enough volume to get results on a daily basis. Okay, 
assuming your KPIs are super locked down, your targeting is super tight, you can literally book 10 meetings a day on this math. Okay. That's assuming you have a 1% booking rate. Now, if you're doing that much volume, chances are you're probably going to lose a, a bit of your ability to target more with more spe uh, specificity. So you'll have to go a little bit more broad to get more quantity. So if you're sending 1,200 to 1,600, uh, 1600 emails per day, that's going to require a lot of quantity. It's going to require, require like 40,000 leads, unique leads every month, 30,000-ish, um, um, which if you're targeting that many people every month, unique people, um, that's going to require you to sacrifice a little bit of your targeting specificity. So you might have to target multiple job titles. You might have to target um, multiple locations um, to kind of broaden up a little bit. So, um, but the more spec uh, specific you get, the, the higher quality an email is going to be. Um, so realistically, you'll be you'll be getting closer to five appointments per day, assuming you get decent KPI. Uh, uh, validation if you're sending 1,200, 600 emails a day. So that's 337 emails or $337 per month on uh, basically, you know, sending outreach. So let's say there's 24 work days in a month. That's around 100 appointments per month. 100 times a 70% show up rate. Uh, that's 70 appointments that show up. A 20% close rate, that's 14 deals per month. Let's say you have an LTV of at least 5,000. So let's say the enterprise, um, you know, let's say it's a 12 month period. Your clients are worth $5,000 over a 12 month period. You just generated $70,000 worth of revenue um, in a month. So that's assuming, again, you have good sales processes. You know how to, you're able to generate meetings. You have good marketing assets. That's a 207.7 X ROI. Okay. So with that being said, you can kind of see why I'm very sold on cold email. So with that being said, here's the overarching protocol and theme of cold email. So I'm going to open this chart up for you. Um, this is going to take a second to load. So let's start at the top up here. I'm recording. Okay, there we go. So the orange is going to be the research phase. Green is going to be acquisition. Red's going to be scaling. Purple is quality control. And then you have the delegation phase, which I'm not going to talk about today. Okay. So first of all, you need to make sure your foundational copy is done. And if it hasn't, go do it. Okay. <laughs> go go do your go go do your research and build your foundational copy. Build your assets. Okay. Purchase domains. Po I, I recommend purchasing at least 10 to start with. If you're not going to do 20, start with 10. Okay. Um, go to phase two, start building, uh, start doing your experimental research. Um, if you haven't done that, go back and perform it. Start uh, craft multiple angles. Do not write one cold email and just rip it. You want to create different variations of your cold emails. Uh, and your messages. It's just like advertising. You want to create multiple creatives, multiple angles. You can't stick with just one thing. You can't rely on one thing. You have to create different iterations. Okay. Build multiple targetable ICPs. So again, don't stick with one ICP, target multiple. Um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be at once. Um, you can target one ICP one month, one ICP the next, one ICP the next. Uh, you're going to scrape at least a thousand prospects. Personalize and segment according to your list. You're going to send 500 emails. So you're going to go through a, like sort of a testing phase, um, which there isn't a category for this in the color scheme, but you want to sort of test um, your, your, your angles, figure out which one's performing the best. Okay. And then um, I can actually probably show you an example. Let's pull up. There we go. So here's a cold email campaign I'm ripping right now. So you'll see right here, email A, email B, email C. You'll see that with positive replies, email A is performing the best, right? I've only sent about 800 emails, 851 emails. Um, so email A is performing the best. So I probably want to double down on that one. Okay. So I probably just want to make a duplicate of this and get rid of email C or email B, right? I'm going to let this campaign run a little bit longer. You want to give... I, I don't mention this in a document, but outreach is going to have a lag effect. Sometimes the lag effect is very short. Sometimes it's very long. 
Um, but you can't expect to see results overnight. Like when you launch a campaign, you should have a testing mentality. See which scripts are working, see which ones aren't working, et cetera. So go through that for about a couple of weeks. Um, it really comes down to the volume. If you sent a thousand unique emails and you're not seeing results similar to this, you probably want to start iterating. Okay, so let's go back to the document. So negative reply, uh, two to three uh, percent PR rate, positive reply rate. Um, if you're get, if you're not getting that, if you're getting negative replies, you want to iterate. If you're getting all negative replies, just iterate. Okay, people aren't resonating with your claim. Um, if you're not getting negative replies, if you're not getting any replies at all, you need to go uh, follow up. Okay, you're going to follow up on email. You want to follow up on LinkedIn. You want to dial them, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the next video. Um, and if you are seeing a two to three percent re uh, positive reply rate, um, you want to see if fifty to sixty percent of your positive reply rates are um, are actually converting to booked meetings. Okay, seventy percent are showing up. Uh, you need to follow up. Also, if there if you're not booking fifty to uh, fifty to sixty percent minimum of your positive reply rates, you need to follow up. Okay, so if you're getting positive replies and you're not getting if, you, if you're even getting booked meetings and you're not getting show ups on the calendar and, and if they're not showing to the call, that's just a matter of following up. Okay, so you're able to book two to three discovery calls per week. Um, if yes, then you have KPIs established. If no, you need to you need to uh, lock your KPIs down and increase volume. Okay, so once your KPIs are established, you need to set up more domains. The, this is just, at this point, it becomes a volume game. Once your KPIs are locked down and you want to get more results, you just increase volume. Okay, so make sure you have good quality control. Um, this part is going to engage over a multiple month span, um, but you want to make sure that the the calls you're getting are qualified and they are your ideal customer. And you want to do that through automation flows. You want to make sure your lists are segmented and cleaned. You want to make sure you're nurturing your leads. Uh, make sure you're documenting through SOPs, stuff like that. And um, anyway, if you're able to maintain high volume and hit your KPIs properly, you have a machine that's fully operational. So if you're hitting, if you're consistently hitting five to 10 qualified appointments per week, um, then you can go on to a delegation phase, which I'm not going to go into um, at, on this video at least. Um, but if you're not hitting these types of results, if you're getting five to 10 unqualified appointments per week, you need to focus on quality control. Um, but if you're getting five to 10 qualified appointments per week, then you can focus on delegation. Okay, this is when you can start hiring sales teams in-house. You can start hiring SDRs. You can start um, build, you can maybe hire a VP of marketing or sales, um, stuff like that. So back to the document um, in pregame uh, you have a scraping phase this is when you're going to start scraping your leads uh, this is more like the technical backend stuff um, uh, and we'll focus on that in part two so I don't make this video too long I'm already at 36 minutes so um, I'm gonna make a part two keep on the lookout with uh, for that um, if you guys are struggling to book appointments um, I'd be happy to look at your system myself and kind of consult you on how we can help you achieve better results. Um, and if that sounds interesting to you, then you can go ahead and book a call in the link in the description um, and we can kind of go from there. Uh, but be on the lookout for part two. All right, thank you guys.